it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Victoria Stoddard. Victoria is a professor in statistics at um, Columbia University. She's visiting our department here in statistics, and in particular, she's been in charge of the big professional master's degree capstone project. So that's oh, cool. yes. At the Star Symposium. Victoria has a PhD in statistics from Stanford, as well as a law degree. And um, she's been really one of the key players uh, behind this whole movement of reproducible research. Um, that's a really, really key aspect of what we do as statistician and with our interactions with, um, with subject matter scientists. So it's really a pleasure to have her talk today about some of our work. Thanks very oh, much. Oh, thank you, Sandra. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. What I wanted to do today was um, have more, hopefully more of an informal discussion. So I was going to lead you through some of um, the history of data sharing and code sharing, particularly in bioinformatics. I mean, you may be familiar with some of this, but it's a, a really fascinating history. And it's more important than just for, um, you know, people who are in bioinformatics, but it's actually, I'm going to try and make the case to you that it's driving a lot of the policy discussions actually in D.C. and in the White House, uh, even though they don't actually realize that a lot of the history is actually from um, computational biology. And then what I was going to do was also talk about some of the tools that people are coming up with to try and resolve these issues around reproducibility. Um, all the open data stuff that I'm going to talk about in bioinformatics wasn't framed as a reproducibility issue, which is very interesting because it's also one of the cornerstones of reproducibility. So then, so then I'll get to um, how the tools are actually starting to really take this on and hopefully try to convince you that tools are a key part of the solution and then and there's been some, hopefully, what you think is cool progress on this, too. Um, so, like I said, it, it's more um, informal than, than formal. So, um, you might know that some of the principles around open data. So, for example, sequence data, it, it's, um, I think, one of the most open fields when it comes to data. There's, you know, structured and organized repositories. I know you all know about it, NIH. Um, if you think of other fields, that's not that common or normal, particularly to such a large extent of the data that's actually used in the field. So you can think of other repositories that are highly organized in other fields, like there's a social sciences repository at Michigan that's, you know, incredible and so on. But if you think about the breadth of data that's used in social sciences, there's just, there's nothing that really matches in bioinformatics, and there's nothing that matches the access and transparency and all the efforts that are put into it in bioinformatics. That comes from a history of sort of people getting together in Bermuda, Fort Lauderdale, Amsterdam, and Toronto. So what I want to do is um, trace you through those um, gatherings and why they happened and what came out of it and the, how it framed a lot of the access to data discussions. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that I've been doing on academic licensing, that can also be a topic for discussion, um, uh, legal obstacles in releasing data and releasing code. And then the blank spot is, is tools. is coming up. Okay, so 1996, there was this Bermuda Agreement. So that's what people mean when they say the Bermuda Principles, which you've probably heard. This was something that came about for a couple of reasons. One was, if you remember, um, or if you don't, I'll explain. This was part of the race to decode the human genome. We were trying to do that by the year 2000, and um, there were different pressures in trying to um, sequence this human genome. So one, of course, was coming from academics with large labs and lots of funding who were trying to sequence the genome. And of course, Craig Venter was the other side with Solera trying to sequence and maybe basically get there first and putting a lot of pressure on the, on the academics. And so the Bermuda Agreement had a couple of things behind it. So there were lots of efforts doing different parts of the genome at that point. And it's almost like hard to imagine now, but in those days, it was extremely expensive, right? We, the sequ sequencing equipment was not, um, that was something really only a few labs could invest in, and they were sort of had lots of federal money behind getting their sort of capital expenditures up to the levels they would need to be able to do this. So you had this situation where you had um, pressure, uh, and, and um, the private industry pressure for sequencing was very real in the sense that 
I think people involved in this on the academic side were worried that um, if a, a private entity was able to do the sequencing first, that would actually close it off to research in some sense or make it more difficult. Or if you wanted to access um, human genome for your own research as an academic, you'd have to go through these channels and maybe license it and so on. So there was sort of a lot of fear and a lot of sense that the researchers and the academics had to get there first just to make it open for research. That wasn't completely unfounded. Um, as I'm sure everybody knows, there's um, uh, patents that can be put on different parts of the genome, and that was something that was new in those days and very real and part of why Venter was actually pushing on this so much. So getting the um, human genome data out into the public domain, part of the idea was creating prior art so that then it couldn't be patented and it would remain open and behind those, those walls, and not behind the patent walls. Okay, so people gather in Bermuda. The cloud hanging around is this venter-fueled race to sequence. Also, the different labs on the um, academic side were also competing, in a sense, and producing different pieces of the genome. And um, so their statement here, primary genome sequence should be in the public domain. It was partially against that sort of fear of closure and privatization. Also, they wanted different community members working on different parts of the human genome to be able to amalgamate their work. And so um, they had to kind of install this culture of sharing if we were going to sort of pin all the pieces together and actually get somewhere. So they said, so Bermuda Agreement, people went to uh, Bermuda. They, I, I don't know exactly why they chose Bermuda. Maybe it was convenient. <laughs> who knows? Uh, I, don't, I don't actually remember what time of the year it was, probably in the middle of winter. But um, 1996. And so this was a big lab head, right? This, these were important people who were doing, who were really heavily involved in the um, production of sequenced data. Okay. It's agreed that all human genome sequence information generated by centers funded for large-scale human sequencing. So those are the people who are at the meeting, right? And you can even see this is language we wouldn't have had today, right? With uh, You don't think of like a large-scale sequencing center anymore. Um, should be freely available and in the public domain in order to encourage research and development and maximize its benefit to society. So in a sense, given the backdrop that I just explained to you, you can maybe read in a little bit of the venture influence here that they really wanted to push and make sure this stuff was in the public domain. Um, research scientists do a lot of work for the public domain. Rarely do they get together and say that's what they're doing, that this is an important principle and we really need to do this. So there was a little bit of that kind of threat going on in the background. And then also, like I said, the other issue that you just had, you know, very powerful leaders, um, academics, that had to be coordinated in a sense here. And you can just imagine what that was like. Okay, primary genome sequence should be rapidly released. So sequence assemblies should be released as soon as possible. In some centers, assemblies of greater than one kilobyte would be released automatically on a daily basis. So they also were addressing the sequester issue. So this idea, and when you sort of start paying attention to discussions of open data and scientific research, very quickly sort of embargoes and sequesters come up. People want to kind of give themselves time to analyze all the data, you know, and then when I'm ready, I'll get it out there, and so on, after I've extracted every possible paper from the data that I can. Um, so this was something that there was an explicit pushback against because of this, all of this, like, getting this out into the public domain before Venter did, um, being able to amalgamate and share different pieces. They just weren't happy with, um, you know, sort of big lab heads that were holding on to data, it needed to be rolled out right away. So this was extremely fast. And that's, you know, we take it for granted now that this kind of stuff happens, but that was, you know, brand new back in those days. Finished annotated sequences should be submitted um, immediately to public databases. So they were sort of like, let's, let's get all this stuff out there. Okay, so that was 1996, and they put that into practice, and then they realized very quickly that they'd sort of forgotten to discuss some issues, so they went back to Bermuda. Maybe it was deliberate to just get back there that February, I don't know. Um, no, I'm sure it wasn't. Uh, so they went back in 97, they went back in 98, and the idea was, again, pulling this community of people generating the data together and uh, deciding on principles. So... Uh, 1997 standards on error rates. So as soon as different people are contributing um, sequence data, there's lots of work to do in terms of standards to make them compatible. And they hadn't discussed that in 1996. They came back to make sure that was standardized so you could sort of compare apples to apples. 
um, one-year maximum claim on a sequence. So they weren't um, insensitive to the fact that if you had invested um, grant resources, time, money, effort, people resources into producing data, that it gave you some claim, um, maybe for analysis for a year, but you still had to release it publicly. But the community was supposed, this was part of the standards that were being um, established. The community was supposed to respect that you had that year, and then they would be able to um, uh, use it in their research. Okay, came back in 1998, and they said, well, yeah, we had that word human in there, right? This was about human data. It wasn't really a need for that. Uh, we can extend this to other groups. Or maybe there was a need because other groups were still sort of orienting themselves to these ideas, because, of course, other groups didn't have that same pressure of the venture sequencing of human genome. So now in 1998, extending the human data release principles to other organisms. Okay, so 1996 had funding agencies there. There was a lot of community buy-in. 1998, they sort of, labs sort of just asserted this on their own, that this should apply to worms, yeah. So the previous slide was that there was a one-day policy for a sequence. You have to contribute it, but you still got that year, I think was what they were hammering. I think that's exactly why they came back in 1998. There was confusion on that. And so you, I think you would still need to contribute this, but there was, I guess, this, I'm sort of inferring, but that there would be um, sort of this respect that it was yours to, you had that year to go ahead and do. But they actually addressed that uh, coming up in some other um, gatherings. Yes. So basically an embargo, a one-year embargo. That was my understanding, but they corrected, well, corrected. They, they, they changed this policy coming up that I'll explain. But, uh. Say, I, my question is also, was it, was it just this hold for a year? So they had to contribute? No, they have to push it out. So it was out. Yep. Mm -hmm. Then how, there's no legal, I mean, as, as far as I know, as, as I'm not an expert in any legal issues, but uh, there is no, um, once data is shared, have, do you have any legal pressure to prevent people to do something? So it's a great question. I don't, I think this was, I don't know, if there, so there weren't kind of, you know, standardized NIH repositories and so on, and I don't know how easy it would actually be to get that if you were outside the community. If you were inside the community, you were in Bermuda, signing on. And so I think that was how they corralled. Remember, this is like, you know, 96, 97, and the bioinformatics was so much smaller then, and it's just, this is, and in my opinion, this is part of why it exploded, being able to make the data available for people to work on, aside from all the applications and so on, yeah. Uh, to some degree, but funding agencies were here too. I mean, if you wanted to keep getting funded, you know. Okay. Okay, so 2003, uh, so a few more years have gone by. They went back to Fort Lauderdale. Didn't actually go all the way out to Bermuda. kind of stopped in Fort Lauderdale. So they come back. So they've got 40 stakeholders reaffirming Bermuda in 1996. There's nothing they want to change. Those original principles, everyone is still, uh, they still stand. It's like they kind of reaffirm their marriage vows. Okay. Uh, but they're recommending. So now they've had time. This is something they put in practice. People have been thinking about this, and they sort of see the cracks and gaps. Okay, so Bermuda extending to apply to all sequence data, including both the raw traces and whole genome shotgun assemblies. One thing I'll mention, unlike everyone in the room, I'm not actually an expert <laughs> in sequence data. Uh, so, you know, you if you need me to sort of um, tease apart different data types, other people might have to help out. Okay, so basically they're trying to scoop in more types of data, right? So that, you know, this is a very holistic uh, data release policy. Principle of rapid pre-publication release should apply to other types of data from other large-scale production centers, and they called these community resource projects. So this sounds like almost a throwaway phrase, but it is actually very important. So they came to this um, agreement that there were certain community resource centers, and one of the reasons they decided to invest in these centers, they meaning... Um, funding agencies and sort of put the money into the sequencing equipment, rather than having more diffuse number of sort of labs all over kind of contributing, they decided to sort of really centralize the capital investments. To do that, you had to convince these other people to give up their efforts. And to do that, you had to guarantee them they were going to get that data that was coming out of those community resources. So this is part of saying to people, we're going to do this in a slightly more centralized way, and don't worry, you're going to get the data. It's on that daily release cycle. You can actually, you don't have to sequence it all yourself. 
So um, these community resource projects, inter stuff everybody's heard of now, International Human Genome Sequencing Consortium, Mouse Genome Sequencing Consortium, and so on, SNP Consortium, <coughs> HapMap Project, were came out of Fort Lauderdale in um, 2003. So this pre-publication data release requirement, you had community-wide support because you want to be the first one, of course, to do the analysis on your data. So that goes to the question about what are your, who's going to stop you? from breaking those norms. They're really explicitly enshrined. And um, I guess you could do it and get kicked out of the community, but it's not good for your research career. OK, the other thing that happened at Fort Lauderdale that was really important and is still, um, still very important in guiding how data is used and probably is almost instinctive to people in here because it's just sort of been imbibed. Um, so there's this notion of tripartite sharing of responsibility. So they had community resource centers and tripartite sharing of responsibility. Those two phrases came out of Fort Lauderdale. So what this is supposed to do is actually get at those sort of um, incentives to cheat a little bit and really set up explicit responsibilities to put moral suasion on people to stick to these agreements. So funding agencies, they have to require, so the tripartite, the three of them, funding agencies, sequence produce, like data producers and data users. So the funding agencies require free and unrestricted data release from these community projects in central and searchable databases. So we're definitely getting more sophisticated here, back to what we were talking about in 1996. So now we're worried about um, what form is the data released and can people find it? It's not such an inside baseball game anymore. Um, and the funding agencies have to make sure this happens. If you're going to fund this, make sure you do it in a principled way, is what Fort Lauderdale is saying. People who are creating the data, so now you have to publish this, what's called a project description, and make your data um, immediately available, and it has to be well described, high quality. So again, we're starting to think about downstream users now, much more sophisticated than the original Bermuda, and also this project description, not only giving documentation and metadata and so on and information about the data so people can use it, um, also giving something you can cite um, and be able to give credit to these people. So that now leads to the users. You have to cite the data. So that's the first mention that we have so far of the responsibility of the data user. It's not the data generator. Um, cite the data sources appropriately, possibly through the project description. So they leave it as an option, but that's what it was there to do. So now you have this, like this sort of linked web of responsibilities that actually creates a, a system that can function. So the, um, the producers can publish their data, pick up the citations the way they feel that they should, and uh, not be so worried about keeping, you know, everything close to the chest and, uh, you know, my ideas are going to get stolen and so on. Um, users have responsibilities too. They can't just go grabbing data using it willy-nilly, they have to cite it. Not only that, but a way to cite it is given to them. Data citing is new. I mean, we talk about this all the time, but in 2003, um, people would not have even, it, just data citation was just a brand new concept and how we even did that was brand new. And then the other sort of leg here is the funding agencies that need to support this too. So don't fund bad actors. Make sure you, you know, this, the funding supports these principles that we're outlining here. So this was, this was really what formed the basis of how this community was going to operate with their collaborative data sharing. And you can see it refines and it overrides actually some of those original small details from Bermuda. Okay. It's hard to believe that was like 11 years ago. Okay, so they gathered again in Amsterdam in 2008. Uh, this agreement was essentially taking all these principles from Bermuda, Fort Lauderdale, extend them out to proteomics data. We don't need to sort of stick with um, only one type. Um, okay, and then again, they, these principles were affirmed again in Toronto in May of 2009. And what is happening here is um, we're, we're losing that idea of such a centralized data producer. We're starting to see things generated in a more diffuse way. There are more actors. And so gathering them together in Toronto, these centers, funding agencies that are outside, like it wasn't just NIH, for example, you could, they could come in and, and sort of hash things out. Yes. Is there a 
That's a good question. So unfortunately, I wasn't there in 1996. I was, however, there in Toronto. So I can actually tell you, if you're interested, how that meeting went. And um, so the first thing is that, remember, these are sort of, in all these agreements, these are the power players. And these, these are sort of very prestigious heads, um, people who have led these research efforts for a long time, very, very strong personalities in this room. And so we're sitting in this hotel that was took place at the Toronto airport, and it was extremely raucous. Like, everybody was, you know... It's not like they all jumped up and had a mosh pit, but, but, so they were, you know, they would talk one at a time, but it was very much like, you know, exactly what you would expect. I mean, this is like the family dinner of like, you know, with all the uncles and aunts and stuff. Um, so a lot of, um, opinions aired. So I wasn't in Bermuda. I can only imagine that, sure, there must have been a lot of resistance and a lot of hashing things out. So, but I don't know. Yeah. I mean, were there people in the room which were actually outside the mainstream or was this? I was there. Right. Yeah, and but I'm not mainstream. You, you did not produce data and did not adhere to these principles. Right? Yeah. I mean, well, oh, Right. No, that's right. So I don't know. I don't know exactly how they came up with the invite list. I actually have it here because I thought someone might ask that. I don't actually even know why they invited me. I guess it's a larger community around open data, I guess. Um, so I don't know what their strategy was, but I think what they wanted to do was make sure that um, it was inclusive, right? You, you didn't sort of have researchers that felt like they were outside of all this thinking and therefore didn't have to involve themselves with that tripartite of responsibility, and uh, they w could, um, you know, bring people in so that people don't feel hostile, like they were left out or, or something like this. I mean, to, if that, I don't know if that was their thinking, but if that was, to me, that made a lot of sense to, to sort of create harmony in the, in the research community. I think there was another question. Yeah. Well, they wanted to, they wanted to sequence the human genome. Yeah. And so that was what kicked it all off. They, they had that goal that they were all centered around. And so they needed either harmony or whatever it was to get that done. And that wasn't something, that was kind of like the, it's like the large hadron collider in those days. We weren't going to have a bunch of independent ones doing it. People had to get together and join forces to get that done. And at least that's my understanding of what it was like in those days. But for the LHC, it's kind of a physical limitation of resources of an instrument of that size. Yeah. I think there were two things. I think that definitely catalyzed people. Um, John Solston has written a book about this that's fascinating called A Common Thread, and he goes through and sort of talks about all the politics behind it and what he was trying to... It's You have to... Real, it's from his perspective, but uh, but it's very, very interesting. And for at least reading that book, it was clear it catalyzed him. You know, so there is that. Um, but then there is... But if you think about, like, my analogy with LHC... Um, it doesn't make sense today, but in the early 90s, the sequencing stuff was like, it wasn't something every lab was going to come up with. Yeah, no, no, so no, that was, that was where I, yeah, so that, that, I think that was real. And, and you had to convince these people to stop doing the sequencing and trust the other people that you were going to get the data if they got the investment and you didn't and stay in the community. It doesn't, those tensions aren't there the same way now, but this is how, how bioinformatics in this community got so advanced in, in data sharing and data access. And you can see this wasn't an accident. I mean, they forced it. Yeah. That's absolutely true. The biology had never been a large scale collaborative discipline. The LHC. Right. Particle right. physics evolved into that mode of operation in a very natural and gradual way. I mean, even the early, the very early detectors, the bubble, ch bubble chamber detectors in the 20s and 30s, right? Those were already devices that required large teams of pieces. And, and, and and the biology labs were used to, I mean, one having lab their funding. End to end process. Yeah. All of a sudden, yeah. they have to give yeah. off big pieces of the scientific pipeline and trust that another team. Yeah, this was totally unfamiliar. And you, you can see, one sec, and you can see that, um, other communities who haven't had that pressure from big capital expenditures, which in physics and here has been one of the drivers, um, uh, if you ask them, just, just ask a researcher in a field that hasn't had these pressures for their data and just, you know, you'll get the same sort of shocked expression. Yeah. So how, how much of the uh, medical or clinical uh, community was there? Is there, or were there any? 
of the medical community? It's a good question. So let me just let me jump out here. Yeah, if I can. Okay, where is it? It's the it's the it's the most resistant thing that I Yeah. Just because of patient protection, right? No, it's a cultural thing. Not only that. Not, oh, but also mental. Yeah, absolutely. They're the they're okay. I know this is filmed, but they're some of the worst chairs actually. <laughs> Um, so this is probably a little bit too small for you to actually read, and I'm happy to make it available. Like I can email it to Sandrine or, or put it somewhere for you. Um, uh, let's. Uh, so, okay. So these are some big sequencers. Um, LBNL is here. Big computational stuff. Um, Bioinformatics Institute and so on. I don't see pharma coming. Uh, I don't see that much med, but I can't exactly tell from this, but I, I, I'm certainly happy to make it available. And so this is the people that were there. Um, I don't know if you know um, you and Bernie. So he was the one who was the big ringleader on this whole thing and corralled everybody and all these divas. It was actually a marvel to see him do this. It was really amazing. Somehow he got everyone pulled together. Yeah, I think, did I just push her off? Okay. Okay. But you can see Francis Collins, like all, every, every big wig was, um, was, made a point of coming. Let's see it. Yeah, so funding agencies, uh, there, and you can see this, they tried to be more, um, inclusive, I guess, so lots of sort of people from all over the world as well. Okay. I don't, maybe it means more to you. I don't know the community that well, but. Um, how many total were there? Five, pa five pages here. Oh. Yeah. So this, I don't know, I didn't look it up how many there are, but that was people. So they had this in the hotel, they had those, you know those ballrooms that have the opening walls <laughs> like through it? They took over that with all the opening walls, so everybody was at the, I should have taken some photos, everybody was at those <laughs> those tables like reading dinner but were not, and uh, so people are, some of them are backwards and like shouting and stuff because everyone's in the little circle. Um, but it was absolutely full and standing room around the outside too. So, um, and th that, was, that was actually, it, it was extremely high energy in there. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's Toronto. Um, same discussions, endorse, so basically endorsing the value of pre rapid pre-publication data release. So new members in the community are hearing that this is still a very important value for us. It's not something that we're relaxing on. Um, for large reference data sets in biology and medicine that have broad utility, the language is getting more sophisticated here in how they talk about this stuff. Um, Pre-publication data release should go beyond genomics and proteomics studies to other data sets. So this was new from Toronto and annotated clinical resources. So, um, and their minimum standard here is release of publication. Okay, so if you, so for, for these um, other new resources that are being folded in. So they're, basically you can see they're trying to get Data sharing to be a much larger issue than just say sequence data. They um, specify some types of specific data. Some of the data is, you know, goes beyond genomics. Yeah, they did. Unfortunately, I don't exactly remember. They had a lot of discussions about that, and I just was not well enough versed to really pick up on all the details. Um, I, I'm sure we could poke around and just find some of those examples, but um, but there are very strong voices for getting the data out there. I mean, this is something like, from 1996, there's, um, it's enshrined in this community. I mean, this idea of getting data out there is just not, it's just a, a principle now that people don't even, nobody thinks twice, you know. Okay, funding agencies, um, they have a role. They're going to announce the release requirements. They're going to start um, having peer review for um, grant proposals, including data set release plans. So um, one thing I'll get to maybe later, if we have time, is um, in January of 2011, National Science Foundation has their data management plan. It's, and if, when you look at it in this light, it's so late, right? Like this is really the beginning of these data management plans by funding agencies. Um, 
Funding agencies are going to give you help to develop appropriate consent, security, access, government me governance mechanisms, so they're becoming much more sophisticated about making sure this is uh, legal, so there's patient protection, and also usable by others downstream. And long-term supportive databases, we all know that, of course, NIH has done an enormous amount to try and, I mean, I'm sure everyone has their criticisms of it, but the support is there, as opposed to something, say, like NSF that doesn't have the same kind of support. So now data producers have a little more on them, producing a citable marker paper with data set information. So more than just a project description, they're getting uh, more detailed now. Simultaneous release of relevant metadata. So don't do something like release the data and then next year you get the metadata that's associated with it that makes it usable. Create databases with all versions archived. So now they're starting to get this sense that versioning might be important in data release. In fact, it's something that now is enshrined in 2009 so that you don't sort of go back and kind of fix earlier things that other work related, re relied on and, um, uh, and make people sort of update results and so on. So they they're starting to get this idea of version control, even for the raw data. Okay, so users um, back off. Let the people who made the data take the first analysis on it. Remember, it's released, so these users can go ahead and do it. Um, cite it when you do it. Cite it accurately, completely. Um, don't get upset if you've used early data and then it has an improvement later or error rates improve, or something like this, or there's been mistakes and before it's calibrated. Now there's a fourth um, sort of leg in the stool here, which is journals. So journal editors, you have to provide guidance to authors and reviewers on third-party use of pre-publication data in manuscripts. So the editors now are seen as having a role in enforcing that tripartite um, sort of like community tripartite responsibilities. Question. Yeah. Do I know who wrote it? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. I'm sure there are some. I'm sure if we just even poked around, we would see cracks and so on. <laughs> no, I don't, I, don't, I don't know actually off the top of my head, but I... I it, it, I mean, these are always put together as ideals, right? Um, so I would imagine there's adoption time lags and so on, and people getting their acts together and so on. Well, I mean, the reason I ask is this always comes up, and it's people very scared that they're going to go through if, in fact, it can happen there. Yeah, I wish I had some hard data on that. That's a really good question. Um, uh, I do... What you didn't ask that I heard is I do know who wrote some of this stuff, and I forgot to mention that, but in that um, ballroom with people at their like white tablecloth around dinner tables and so on, and then you and Bernie up there with a couple of other people on um, the stage with a, um, a big table, and then he's got this screen and he's doing collaborative stuff. And um, there was a report that was published in Nature that came out of this, and he would say things like, what about this sentence? Like, is, does this express our, what we think is correct in the room? And people would say, no, you know, that's be misinterpreted this way. Here's better phrasing and so on. And so they actually got principled hammered, hammered down. And then um, because I was there, I was on the list when they were also putting that into a paper format. And that was also done collaboratively. So drafts were sent out and so on. And um, so you can read the nature paper, and that was, you know, you and actually writing this up and throwing it back to the people in the room for feedback, and then people kind of writing it collaborative. And you can see it's got, like, not a physics-level list of authors, but everybody's on there as an author who participated. Um, so I won't actually switch out and show you this, but um, I got inspired by some of this stuff. And so in 2009, um, when I was at Yale Law School, I held a data and code sharing roundtable, much smaller scale. I had a smaller budget than, uh, you know, bringing all these people together. So we had about 30 people who um, came together. And we tried to hammer out a declaration of principles around data and code sharing in computational science more broadly understood. And so we talked about issues like um, code, for example, which you probably notice that things like software and code and so on are totally absent from that discussion around uh, sequence data. So was any notion of reproducibility as a principle per se. Right. It may have been in the background of some of that discussion, but um, that wasn't. They didn't get together and say we've got a reproducibility issue. We've got to get open data taken care of. They had other issues that pushed them. Okay, I, maybe I can come back to this if, if you're interested. It was um, a little while, a little while ago now. Um, okay, so um, 
I wanted to mention about some of the stuff I've been doing that, let's see where we are in time. Okay, we're almost out of time. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'll come back to this at the end, but um, some of the work that I've been doing is thinking about releasing data, releasing code, releasing the paper, and if you're doing this on the web, you run smack into all sorts of IP issues as soon as you do that. And you can see in some of the um, agreements, they were starting to think about um, IP issues, usability issues, legal issues, and sharing. And so some of this is work to um, basically work within default copyright arrangements that we're subject to, our code is subject to, our data can be subject to, um, not just our paper, and how to actually share stuff so it's usable. But I wanted to spend a little more time on tools, so maybe what I'll do is just kind of um, dive in here. Okay, so I draw this uh, distinction in these discussions about reproducibility. Um, a lot of the, so there's been a lot of headlines, a lot of articles and um, editorials and so on over the last year about this crisis in reproducibility and so on, uh, appearing in Science, Nature, you know, New York Times, whatever it is. Uh, most of them, what they talk about is um, Someone can't replicate the experiment. So, for example, in this in psychology, there's been a lot of discussion around this, where they actually try and redo the actual whole experiment, and then they end up with different findings. So, this is something where um, I think this uh, is a certain type of problem with a certain type of solutions, and it's very distinct from things like in the computational world using computers to augment and uh, augment traditional research and ask new types of questions, and how do you adapt process to ensure that what we're doing in the computational realm is just as good science as any other realm. And so in my opinion, a lot of what has been happening in these discussions around reproducibility, or what I've been calling empirical reproducibility, nothing's really changed fundamentally in the way that they do the research. It's just they've started to notice that Reporting standards are lax. Statistical methods are very poor. Um, reporting of statistical methods is poor. It's hard to find out what even happened in the paper. Things that, these are actually old problems that have been around since about the 1660s earlier. And, uh, and we have mechanisms for trying to solve some of this. And so empirical reproducibility, um, what I call like in meat space, so physically, like, are you describing the experiment you're doing at the bench well enough so people can replicate what you're doing? And I think this is in contrast to what I've been calling computational reproducibility, where really computers are brand new over the last 20 years and fundamentally changing the types of research that, um, that we do, like the types of questions that we ask, and changing the research process itself. So just for example, um, uh, Using a computer makes it so much easier to carry out a lot of steps on, of analysis on your data, right? Just to take the most sort of trivial example, and then capturing these steps and explaining it in the same way that worked for, say, someone at the bench in the lab, um, is just insane, right? It's just so much easier to do these much more complicated tasks with a computer, and there's really no room to report a lot of this stuff. So that's one thing that's happening. And another one is how you have um, uh, code storing intellectual contributions that don't appear any anywhere else in the actual uh, publication itself. So you have now code producing this sort of new scientific element that just people didn't have it and it wasn't thought about in this sort of traditional space. So I think you know, the way I've been thinking about it is splitting this into two issues. One is this empirical reproducibility. There's a Nature article, I think, last year by Begley called Try Harder. And it's this idea we have standards and let's just do a better job of enforcing it. I don't think you can just try harder and get a solution in computational science. There's really a whole new set of procedures, a new way of thinking, and a new way of thinking about how we carry out the research and disseminate the research. So I wanted to focus on the computational reproducibility aspect because rather than just trying harder, people are being very innovative about the types of solutions to allow us to capture experiments better before we publish, so we can share code, data, and make these things reproducible. This, this are, both these are now being driven by reproducibility concerns, not just by Craig Venter. Um, and then also post-publication, how do you share access? How do you, how would you reproduce an experiment that I did, for example? Okay, so let me just, Maybe I'll come back and motivate. So that's a project I've been working on that is a tool. So what, um, 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's go here in the last few minutes. Um, I very very roughly divided tools that I know about, and there's tons that probably I don't know about, and they're not omitted on purpose. This is just sort of gathering some stuff together to give people an idea. Um, I divided them roughly into three categories. So dissemination. At the point of publication, how can I do things like make re reproducible research available? How can I do things like link it up to a published paper? Um, this is what I'm calling dissemination platforms. There's quite a lot here. The one that I've been working on, Research Compendia, I've been doing some work on Run My Code. I'll show you a few of these. Um, they're just, some of them are just amazing. Like, iPaul is really amazing. Open Science Framework is really amazing. And I want to mention, too, that with these tools, just about all of them, there are some notable exceptions, but just about all are academics putting stuff together on the side, you know, and really trying to make um, a difference and make a change. This, generally speaking, it's not these kind of, it's not, you, you know, some big software company that's kind of descended and they're putting tools together for us. These are people mostly doing this without actually any reward. They just think it's the right thing to do and they have some ideas and they put it together. Okay, workflow tracking and establishing research environments. So we're very lucky to have IPython Notebook Creator in the room. So um, capturing what you're doing in your experiment in such a way that you can actually share those steps in a coherent way. Um, there are others, too, with different takes on how to do this. Taverna, I mean, I'm sure people know about a lot of these tools in here, um, but I'll have a look. Um, Taverna, um, tracking how, for example... <laughs> You use different software plugin as you go through. A lot of this is um, bioinformatics and gene pattern. How do you? So that was a collaboration with Microsoft and the Broad Institute um, at Harvard MIT. Um, being able to put objects, figures in a Word document where you could <laughs> click on it and see the pipeline that had actually generated that heat map, for example. Um, uh, VizTrails creating an environment, again, for you to do computation, a lot of it in um, uh, Python and other languages. And so most of this is really, I think all of them here are largely about um, helping the scientists affect uh, a process that really allows them to do this high-quality reproducible work. There are also a series of, I should probably have Knitter on here too, there's a series of um, tools that are coming out that aren't really, don't really fit in any of those bins, and what they're trying to do is create a document that allows you to kind of dig in and, um, I guess almost like Python Notebook, it kind of be an embedded publishing as well, but the um, reader of your document has a way of digging in and seeing codes and e executing within that document, and you've kind of built it that way as a researcher. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about a few of these. Um, let's see, so... Let's see this one. This one I imagine that you haven't heard of. Okay, so this is called Image Processing Online. This one's really nice for a demo because um, it's about images. So I can show you some figures and how they've dealt with this. So Image Processing Online, the approach these folks took, this is um, a research group in France, but it's open to anyone. The, they, they've decided to create a new journal. So these articles are submitted, or peer-reviewed, and then they come out. So their approach is, let's just step around journals altogether. Let's see if I can make this a bit bigger. So it's a, IPOL is a research journal of image processing and image analysis. Each article contains text on an algorithm and the source code and online demonstration facility that it's easiest if I just even tell you about it. Okay. So just picking, I just picked the first paper that was in the list here. So every paper will have a page like this, and uh, you can download here PDF and also source code. So they're intimately linked on the paper and not appearing anywhere else. Um, other, so this just, I think you can, yeah, so this is what the article actually looks like, a typical scientific article. And you notice these two other tabs here, so they've kind of, decorated the article in some sense on the web page with the data that was used in the paper. So here they're doing the image processing, they have the algorithm implemented, and then what you can do is select data, click on an image, use it as input. Let's just take whatever this one is. Okay, set your parameters. I don't know what the paper is doing or what algorithm <laughs> it's going to uh, actually put on the image. But what, presuming you do know this, you can go ahead and run it. 
And uh, the nice thing is the code's optimized to run very quickly for all these papers. And then you can see, so this is a little bit, maybe this is a little better, but you can see the input, output, and so on, the effect of the algorithm. Okay, so you can play with this yourself, and you don't have to actually use their images. You can upload uh, your own data, so I could put an image that I just snapped and put it in there and have the algorithm run on it. And archive is really cool because it shows you all the images that have been run on there. So people just, I don't know what this sand thing is, but someone decided it would be really interesting to apply that algorithm to their sand image. Um, and you can see this actually, it's a new article and there's 19 pages of all these images that people have just been messing around with. Okay, let's just pick around. So no kidding. Or like some car thing or something. There's some interesting ones. Like they're sure that for some of the algorithms it's um, police, FBI stuff, and they're trying this stuff out on different images that they have. And so, and so they've told me that sometimes they get, um, people are surprised and they'll get an email and be like, can you delete my image off of the thing? I don't want it out there. And so, yeah, or whatever it is. So yeah, I don't know exactly what that is. But, um, but the point being that the, again, these are these are researchers who have day jobs and have just put this together. And this is actually all open source, all written in Python. You can grab iPaul and spin up your own version if you want. Um, but we can be a lot more creative about how we disseminate our science. When it's computational, we can put this computational stuff out there. Okay, so that's that's an image processing, and they're they're lucky because they have their algorithms are running pretty quickly. Their data is relatively small with these images, and they can sort of turn this stuff around in these nice applications. So some of the stuff, um, let's see. Okay, I wonder, oh, this one I should mention. Okay, so this is outside um, bioinformatics, but um, this is the open science framework. So this is, this is actually getting a reasonable amount of press these days. So um, open science framework is led by a professor, psychology professor called Brian Nozick in um, University of Virginia, and he put together this platform to house projects around reproducibility and open science. Let's see, maybe I should look. Okay, this is not, okay. Okay, so the, I'm not getting a good explanation page. So one of the things that, that the center is doing is this reproducibility project. So he's choosing 50 papers from, I think it's from 2009, um, the top three, 2008, top three journals in um, experimental statistics, Journal of Personality Social Psychology, Psych Science, Journal of Experimental Psychology, Learning, Memory, and Cognition. And then you can see he's got a lot of sort of um, grad students, crowdsource volunteers, and so on, and they're really replicating the experiments, not just replicating the computational aspects. And the idea is, um, if we can't replicate it, what are we, what are we doing as scientists? So we, you know, it's all just meaningless if it doesn't ever extend beyond the initial experiment. So they're going to, so they're doing this kind of large scale validation study. And, um, he's turned this, he got some additional funding and has turned this, uh, into this, it's hard for you to see, but this open science framework to allow people to do things like have data code, um, linked with, um, uh, their work as well and turn this into much more of an open science creative platform. So I'll take just the last few moments, and I'm happy to have questions on any of the other stuff, just on one thing that I've been working on, which is research compendia. So um, it's actually evolved a little bit since this page, but what we're trying to do with research compendia is to serve a very simple rough cut at trying to associate code and data with a published paper. So on the website, we would have, okay, so maybe I can just go out there, actually, it would be a little more accurate. Okay. All right, so um, on the website, what it is is just a collection of pages where, let's take a look at this one, where we link out to the original published article. So the article's published somewhere. It could be on archive, could be SSRN, or in a journal. So it backs out to the page. And then this one is really dedicated to accessing code and data. And you can see here, you can download um, code, data that are associated with that paper, and there's an abstract around code and data, and then the paper abstract, and the authors of the code may be different than the paper authors and so on, so there's more flexibility here. 
what we're working on is having, yeah? We are just about to. So um, we just got that organized, and we're going to mint DO, a DOI for code, DOI for data. So the idea is get it to the most granular citable level. So that we had a big discussion about that, but we're going to do that. So we'll have the DOIs. Um, and we're, we have pilots that just aren't quite next week. They're probably ready to show you on um, an iPaul-like executability. So we've got code and data right now. It you'll download and get it working on your system, which is everyone knows is really painful, so we're asking you to please remember to cite when you download here. Uh, but we'll, what we'll do is implement this and then um, allow you to mess with it through this compendium page. So the idea would be similar to the iPaul idea of changing parameters, running the code, we'll have it running in the cloud, or not changing parameters, you can just verify the results. In a sense, you sort of have to trust that we did the implementation correctly, but you can download it and do it yourself if you want. Um, or feed in different data, like an updated data set and so on, and have these sort of more interactivity around, um, around the papers. Okay, so I think I'm out of time, but there are more, there are lots more tools, and my slides are on my website, and all of these are hot linked if you wanted to fool around with any of them. And I think you had a question. Oh, um, yeah, about the code, is there standard requirements for the type? It's a really good question. So we haven't, we have a FAC on there, and what it does is it sort of suggests things, and we're seeing as we start to do the replication and executability pilots, we're allowing um, information to sort of bubble up on what people need to do. So we're thinking we might ask for uh, one wrapper script that generates each figure, for example, just to make things very straightforward. But we're trying to make it, uh, I, I don't think any of these will work if we ask the a researcher to fundamentally change what they're doing or give them a big burden. So we're trying to work as much as we can without bothering them. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons I found that code doesn't get distributed with the paper is because it's often very buggy. Yeah. Um, so what are you doing to try to ensure that you're only supporting, supporting stable code? So, so, so code can mean a whole lot of different things. So code could mean something like, um, short scripts that interact with an interpreted language and, uh, are relatively stable. So in that sense, the, the way we think of versioning here is code and data are fixed with a particular paper. So that's snapshot and they all go together. So if you find, so that's a, one of the, another rationale for research compendia, if you find bugs and so on in the code, I mean, it's very likely. That's one of the reasons for sharing it. It's that code's buggy. Um, you can either have a new compendia page or we could put new versions on there so that this all gets back into the community because right now there's really no way to sort of feed that information back into the community. Um, so, so it's, but it, it kind of like your question sort of, um, it, it really goes to the heart of why we're even doing this. If the code's not stable or has mistakes in it or, you know, we should actually find that out and flush that out. So the other thing too is, um, um, we're not, none of us, I don't think, we're, none of us are sort of trained software developers and we're not creating production level code. So something hacky, I think that's fine as a rough, like for me. I mean, I know people feel, I have many, many stories, like people who don't want to share data and people who don't want to share code. Um, uh, but, but I think, I, I don't think like having something that's like production level stable works in different environments. I, I think that's just way beyond what we could reasonably expect a scientist to do. They put out a toy that works in one environment. Um, I think that's awesome. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So, yeah, it's very fascinating. I mean, the, the question is a little bit, how can one actually track the co contributions of other people? Make and how could this be used? I mean, as you know, we have all this, you know, the citation yeah. and stuff and so on. But I mean, we need also to create a different value system. Absolutely. So one of the things we've been thinking about is there's lots of stuff that's been developed in the open source software community that goes to those questions, like how people collaborate on really big projects and track contributions, and they don't use a clunky system of citation the way we do, right? And um, and so we what we'd like to do, and we're I wish I had a pilot here to show you, is have an interface, say, with GitHub. And then that allows sort of a more kind of intelligent, in a sense, way of structuring how you can sort of see, because someone will, you'll, you're, you know when someone's taking your code and kind of they're using it in a different way or they're making modifications and that's all something traceable. So we're not trying to reinvent stuff here, but merely overlay on, uh, to bring these different tools together and, um, 
uh, and, and try and make things a little more useful and a little more usable. But, but I think you're right. I mean, fundamentally what we're doing is we're taking this very old system of almost writing letters back and forth about what we're doing. And then we're trying to sort of shoehorn it into a modern phenomenon. And it's like, um, uh, when, um, I think Google did that project where they were like, okay, if we invented email today, what would it look like? And they tried to rebuild the whole system. And in a way, it would be really cool if we could do that too. It would look really different, but we got to go there step by step. It's sort of like all the Bermuda stuff. We've got to bring the community with us as we go. So. So, let yeah. me, uh, to the data sharing aspect, the, uh, one of the problems is that uh, people don't want to share their data too freely because they don't uh, get the citation. And even if you have a data paper, you know, mm -hmm. data spending with me, and uh, you, you, could, you, know, you could get cited because you're not using the data, but just like uh, you know, cite the, uh, the data set for some other reason. Yeah. So do you know uh, what's the sort of the, the path forward? You know, is PubMed starting to do something about like having a specific uh, contribution? Oh, I wish. Or, you know, yeah. Not that I know of. Um, so PubMed, they just did their whole commenting system. And so I suppose, and I, th I know one of the rationales behind it was you could put in comments code data and sort of links and so on. But it, But again, it's this sort of like hacking this like a system that fundamentally isn't really set up for that, for that kind of thing. Um, there's other issues too, like, um, you know, in, in, in sharing data where, um, you know, folks, you, you could sort of see in that tripartite of responsibility, citation was this key linchpin that, that had to be in there. And, um, fundamentally all that stuff was really trying to attack this collective action problem. So, you know, you don't want to share data because someone might not cite it. And so you sort of have to have these citation standards at the same time as someone will want to use it. So everything kind of has to move together. And, um, one of the things that people say sometimes too is why should I share my data? Like people don't really cite it properly and uh, I have to put a lot of work into this. And, um, you know, all it does is benefit like my colleague down the hall, you know, and, you know, I'm trying to get tenure or whatever. <laughs> so why would I put my work into that? And so that shows where it's really this collective, like we, as a community, like the different communities, everything really have to go through their own Bermuda and sort of push this in, in some sense to have these standards so that, um, we sort of move as a group rather than these kind of, there's a lot of valiant efforts and a lot of scientists who are just like, I'm going to do it how I think is right. But most of them run into these, these same questions and, um, I get a lot of questions from junior researchers and students, like, how do I do this? Like, I really, you know, I'm very familiar with the open source software world. I ascribe to what they do. I'm actually shocked at the practices that I see in the scientific community. They don't feel right to me. On the other hand, I know that if I take time to really do all this data code sharing reproducibility the way that feels right to me, I'm publishing one or two papers less a year or something. And this is a material impact on my career. So how do I balance this stuff? Victoria, <laughs> you know, like that's the kind of thing they tell me. So, um, okay. so that's part of a longer discussion. Yeah. How do we convince people that publishing two correct papers a year is better than publishing four wrong papers a year? Someone was that's telling me. Like, yeah. Well no, Peter, I, I had. And, and publishing software, good software, is yeah. at least considered as good as you would traditional. Yeah. 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 And I, I think part of it, part of it is citation too. Like yeah. Well, yeah. I I had lunch with a statistics professor here the other day, and he said he was trained in the the standard of you publish one and only one paper a year. And things have changed. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't say it was solved, no, no, but, right, but, 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 but I think people have been thinking about that for a long time, right? Um, can you say more about, I mean, did you think there's any, well, I mean, answer the sum, but can you say more about what links there are to those two reactors? Um, so I think we didn't have, we didn't have to make 
a distinction between replication and reproducibility before we were using computers. They were just the same thing, in a sense. Like this idea of taking the computational work that someone has done from a digital version of the data set and just being able to chunk through, it, like, for, sort of like your first thing you want to do is chunk through and get their results, right? Um, that didn't ha that, this is, this is kind of a new concept, I think, for the scientific community. What we were used to from the sort of empirical reproducibility is, um, I should give you a really good description of what I did such that you should, now, it's a separate question whether we ever had reproducibility. And, and lots of people have been like, you know, of course we didn't. The way it worked is you would you get a visitor from the other lab who would show you how to do it. You know, you, you, you would try to write. But I think that is because it's just so hard to capture the tacit knowledge. And so one of the very awesome things about bringing in computers and moving towards this sort of computational reproducibility versus sort of independent um, replication of the results is we capture so much more of that tacit knowledge now. So sometimes people say to me, why do we have to have this much higher bar? Like, you know, we just sort of had a few descriptions in the paper for hundreds of years. It seemed to work fine. Uh, why do we need to save every little computational step now? And I think that the way to frame it is really the reverse. Like, given that we can easily save all these steps, um, why would we jettison that when it helps reproducibility? Why do we have to fit ourselves into standards that were created for a different era when we can do a lot better in capturing that tacit knowledge? Absolutely. Of course. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And I, th I think people are really just starting to get their minds around this, that it, it's a new problem. It's not a trivial thing we solved in 1660s. Yeah. Data that's shared be useful. There should be the metadata describing the data, and the data should be in some kind of format that's machine readable, and also the metadata should be machine readable. But there's some domains like neuroscience that there's many different heterogeneous types of data. It's much more complicated than like, genomic data. Of course. But it's probably true in, in like, it's not neuroscience, it's not one example, it's many, many different things. I think that's so right. Are, are, are you aware of um, like, approaches that people are following to try to have standard ways of describing the metadata that they have? Yeah, there's, so there's, there are efforts. I mean, this is, for people who are interested in this, this is a well-recognized problem. I think it's not, it hasn't really reached the level of discussion, like the level of consciousness of something like you need to get your data open. And, um, so I think it's sort of been a delayed discussion, like talking about even just getting large, like, not that great, not that well-documented data or code out there. It's, that's a huge step, even just that. And sort of, you know, pummeling people with, yeah, did you get all the metadata sorted out correctly? And is it machine readable? And make sure your software is in a version control system and you have all these documentation standards built into it. It's just, it's a lot for people to sort of drink in right at the beginning and probably would discourage a lot of this. But there's no question we have to do this. I mean, there's no question this has to, and the, the question is, um, I think librarians are actually stepping up and they see themselves as part of the, um, having a role in taking data that might be sort of, um, uh, I think they call it an egress from a research lab or community, and then they sort of suck this up and turn it into something that's more usable, um, including metadata and so on. It's not really happening yet, but I think some people, and librarians are so specialized in metadata and how to do this, that it seems like a natural place to, to work with them, but, um, so people are thinking about it. Yeah, Fernando. You know, on this topic, go, going with, with my usual approach, trying to do the dumbest thing that could possibly be useful. Um, I had an interesting conversation with a folks running Dataverse a couple of months yeah. ago um, about basically, I mean, they're in the business of providing these data repositories for sharing data sets at, at the Dataverse project. Right. I think a lot of it is in sort of social sciences and economic data sets, but those are often data sets that are somewhat messy and complicated and whose interpretation is subject to exactly how you read it and whatnot. They're not very well standardized mm -hmm. uh, formats. No, they're not. Maybe CSV, but what, what that CSV means is really open to interpretation. Yep. And so the suggestion that I made, and, and I think we're gonna, we're gonna try and see wh whether it flies well, was why not, along with the data set, include a companion document, which is not simply some human readable readme thing, but an actual IPython notebook that basically implements the loading of the data set and the computation of a few basic statistics, a few basic properties, a few common quantities. Like a sanity check. That right. demonstrate, exactly. Yeah. That demonstrate how do you load it, what are the relevant quantities, and how, how do you parse that metadata, and produce a few standard results off of that data. Set. Or even a few results that, that are in that paper and that that person. And then, and that those are sort of tests against exactly. the, against the data. Which is 
executable, and that way you kind of bypass a little bit you know, the whole web. We haven't agreed on a single common standard for, for metadata for all this because I am my own unique snowflake, and therefore I can never agree with anyone else on how to interpret it. You say, fine, read your snowflake, encode that uniqueness into this document. That anyone who downloads the data set will get it together with, they can open it, they can run it, they can see it, and then they can take it from there, they can do novel things with the data, etc. Yeah. But at least it's sort of a zero order sanity level with a tool that is kind of a natural tool that, that, that people yeah, are Yeah, no, I, I think that would be... Whether the actual language is MATLAB or Python or Bash or, yeah. or R or Perl, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Like, we're, not, we're not kind of biasing on that. And we'll see. They said that they were going to give it a try. Yeah, yeah I think that, that kind of thing is a great idea. To, to the data yeah. I mean, we need to, see, we, we, I think at this point, the communities are ready for these types of more sophisticated discussions, like the issues that you raise. It's not just about getting, like, hammering people over the head with open data, open code, and so on. I think that this level of sophistication people are now receptive to. I think the, the principles are there. Um, but you also see, one thing that I've seen is sort of these, this strange behavior, um, I think it's strange. Obviously, they don't think it's strange. But um, you want to use someone's data set, and they'll say, well, I need to be a co-author. Or you want to use someone's code. And um, I think that's totally absurd. Right, like, but, but part of it, and I, you know, I, I think these people are out of line, but part of it is because we don't have good citation standards. So I think they might be happier it to be cited, but right now there's not that sort of middle ground, and that's really all they got. But the idea of, of being on a, an author on a paper just because you produced a data set that was produced for some other paper is a bit, is a bit absurd. But you see these norms evolving around this, and so I think of having um, discussions about what are appropriate norms are, is really important. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what I mean. Like people push the envelope when we don't have norms around this. So it's an important discussion. Yeah. That's uh, that's been. An, I, I skipped over those slides very quickly, but that's an undercurrent to a lot of this. I mean, not all of it's publicly funded, but a huge amount is, and that is sort of like I guess people do philosophically kind of watch on to that. That that we do have this obligation, therefore, to make things available. Yeah. And I was saying that the culture seems to be really changing, seems to be pushing against open door now because people really agree that it needs to be able to get over the data and get the code and get to the location. He said, why? Why now? Oh, why now? Do you want me to answer? <laughs> yeah. To me, the culture is changing very rapidly. And it's not, when I thought about it, it wasn't absolutely clear to me why that is. Well, to me, it's changing really slowly. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a question of perspective. But um, but I think it's just going in lockstep with a lag. I don't know how long the lag is, maybe two, three years or something. But with the penetration of, or maybe 20 years, I don't know, um, of, of computational methods, uh, we're just... Too many voices are now piping up and saying, you know, I produced these these results that were produced with some black box that I can't verify, and I don't understand what's going on. And I've heard the the uh, one senior researcher say that, you know, he goes to these computer science conferences, computational science, and person after person gets up and they'll give what he calls a breezy demo. So it talks about I have some data. Look at this cool algorithm I implemented. Look at these cool results. And it's kind of like, then you sit down. And if we go back to um, sort of principles of science, the reason we have a lot of these standards and process for how we do work, how we share work, how we understand other people's work, is because we know the whole thing is fraught with error. We could all make mistakes at any time. And all this transparency is not just because we're publicly funded uh, in general, but it's because we're trying to get it right. And that's the only way to actually get it right. Like, you, you, we've got to see it. And so these are sort of really old principles. And so now we're realizing that with a lot of the computational science, it's becoming near ubiquitous. Um, that With that missing, we've got a real problem. So psychology, they're talking about the, the discussions that are happening there are that's empirical reproducibility, not computational reproducibility. So why that? So now, why is this becoming a big issue in um, empirical reproducibility? Why is this hitting the press in the last two years? I don't know, actually. 
I know that it was triggered by, you know, studies at Amgen and uh, Bayer and so on that couldn't do replication, but it doesn't seem to me that that's fundamentally changed in the last, like, 50 years, so why now? We report better, we have better access to journals, maybe we have better some of it. So uh, one thing that Sandrine and I were talking about before that you guys, I guess, have talked about the Nevins and Pody case. So the only reason that got cracked open was because of Bermuda and half the data he, like, um, MD Anderson folks could actually get and start from the data point. If they couldn't get the data, they weren't actually going to be able to blow that case open. And so I think things like that, we're starting to get little cracks where we can actually see that there are errors in there and that it's actually a bigger issue. And, and then, um, and then that we report more or whatever it is, we communicate faster or whatever. I'm sort of, that's, it's all conjecture, but that's what I think has gone on the empirical side. And on the computational side, over the last two years, I've just seen this astronomical acceptance of this issue. And I've been talking about this issue for four or five years now. And I can remember talks in the beginning where people would be like, <laughs> you know, like, and then, and, and then, well, I was, it was discouraging because I was, you know, trying to say these things and I believe what I was saying. And, um, but then the, the flip side of that story is these very same people now, uh, they act like they've always agreed with me. And this is the most, this is the most obvious thing in the world. And of course we need this and they're, they're all on board. And so I don't, I don't say otherwise, which I'm just happy to see that. But that's in the last, yeah, right. <laughs> that's in the last 18 months or two years that I've seen this sort of change. And so, I don't know, theories around network effects and so on and information percolation, but it seems like we're really kind of sort of cusping on a tipping point in the computational side. And um, I'm not sure what's going to happen in the empirical side. I, it, it's actually, I think, both are very hard challenges. Empirical stuff is really hard. A lot of the empirical stuff, I think, with... Um, uh, with psychology, I think a lot of that will start to be solved too with openness. If you think about the Mark Hauser stuff that happened at Harvard where he, um, apparently, if I'm understanding correctly, he actually did videotape the experiments with the, um, I think it was a type of monkey, I think, that was responding to stimulus. And then his grad students, uh, so I think, if I'm understanding correctly, saw a mismatch between what they had seen and what was being recorded and so on. So release the video data. Right, and then that starts to, it starts to kind of bring these other problems um, into light. Isn't part of the, uh, the answer that the, uh, the pressure for communication is getting so high? Yeah. Uh, that goes with the, uh, the yeah, scrutiny of the... Relative. So people are cutting corners? You, I mean, yeah, so I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I think in a the field like neuroscience, it's the sheer pressure, they can't deal with the rich data so it's really kind of a form of resource allocation. They want data sharing became, became popular also over the last few years in neuroscience because they realize there's so much more in the data than what a single lab can do. With it. Yep. So I think resource yep. allocation between and in communities is a big, is actually a big motor of, of getting more open. It's, and citation will help with that too. It's also interesting to think about where does reproducibility take place. I think this is, this is a discussion I've sort of started to hear communities have. If you think about something like mathematics, logic, and so on, um, all the re reproducibility takes place before publication, right? The proof is checked, then it go can be published. Empirical sciences, it's after publication. It's sort of, there's this kind of, Ah, oh, that looks pretty reasonable. But no one goes and does the physical bench experiment before publication to make sure it works. That's always been something they've considered that other scientists will do after publication. It will have that verification. So the question I've been wrestling with is, where does that fall for computational science? Is that something we should be able to do this kind of research compendia, click the button, I, Paul, click the button, replication of the results? Maybe that's something we can actually do before um, publication, like it's a proof. And then other types of validation or extensions or putting the work on different data sets and so on, or doing the independent full kind of empirical style reproduce, reproduction of the, the work, maybe that's post-publication. So where that lands, I think, is something that um, is an open discussion. At least in my mind, maybe, maybe you guys know the, the right answer. <laughs> I do see this acceleration of this kind of critical critical network effect happening. I think the rise of of internet based collaboration and yeah. the source movement has played a role. I mm -hmm. think that has I mean So we've had to use these tools. Not, it's not five years old, but it's 
penetration, the rise of GitHub, yep. the kind of pervasive penetration of these ideas, I think has had an impact yeah. on, on the academic side. Yeah. And we've been doing this for 10 years, some of us in the room, kind of scientific yep. open source. Yep. And, and up until a few years ago, we were sort of kind of like marginal. In the yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And then all of a sudden, there's been, there's been a penetration of those ideas yeah. uh, into, into sort of more established academia. Yeah, I mean, there's some really glad about. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, so okay. We thank uh, Ask Victoria for a terrific talk and discussion. I just wanted to know much of us are meeting at uh, Treehouse, which is right after yeah. the seminar. Yeah. So let's thank Victoria. Oh, thank you. <laughs>